Today I feel the pleasure of the Lord as we go to this message. It was William Randolph Hearst, a billionaire, who made his fortune as a newspaper publisher. He decided at one point with all of his money that he was going to be a great investor in the great works of art. So one day he was reading an art magazine and he read about a valuable piece of art and he decided that he wanted to buy it. And so he called his agent in and he sent him to go anywhere in the world but find this piece of artwork. The agent searched and he searched and he searched all over the world, Italy, Russia, France. He could not locate this beautiful piece of artwork. So he came back home and he said, look, I have searched the world and I cannot find it. But Hearst was insistent. He said, you haven't searched far enough. Keep searching. And so he sent him out and over a year of searching for this particular piece of artwork, finally the agent came back home and said, sir, we have found it. Mr. Hearst was so excited. He said, you found that valuable piece of artwork that I asked you to look for? He said, yes. He said, that is wonderful. Where was it? Sir, it was right in your warehouse. You had bought it several years back. You know, when I read that story, it reminded me of how you and I are always looking for somewhere and something else of value when what we have in Christ is the greatest treasure that life could afford. So often we don't realize what we actually have. We don't realize how blessed we have been, how blessed we are, how fortunate, how favored. I'm telling you, I want to go on the record by saying, when you look back at Hurricane Harvey from the bird's eye view, it looked like it was just about that far that we escaped flooding of 30 to 50 inches of water. I don't take that lightly. I simply stop and I look up and I say, thank you, Father, for sparing us. Thank you, Father, for watching over us. Thank you, Lord, that we didn't have to dig out and, and redo like we've had to done before. Oh, come on and give me some praise for it. You see, we often get so excited about the next thing we think we need. We crowd and busy our days with a lot of activity and we're missing the most important thing. And that is what he has already given to our lives. What a moment it had to have been for this billionaire, Mr. Hearst. You mean to tell me you've looked all over the world and I already owned this piece of artwork? I can't begin to even explain what he thought in his heart. How careless I've been. How empty I am to think that I need something then I already own it. This morning I want to begin to prepare the groundwork for what God really wants from you and I. In fact, Psalm 50 is an amazing psalm. It really is a revelation of God's judicial sovereignty. And it's God breaking into the life of his people and telling them, what you've been given me is an insult to me. And I want to show you why. On November the 5th, I'm calling everyone to bring a special offering called a thank offering. I've never preached on this, I've never really presented this, but I believe in my heart this is the will of God for us. The thank offering is called Savaka Hatoda in Hebrew. It is an offering made as an expression of thanks which releases a powerful spiritual force and blessing upon us. In the Old Testament, thank offerings were established by God. They were for special occasions to present the thank offering. There were three in particular for deliverance from sickness or distress or death. Following a vow made to God that he will keep what he has promised as you fulfill your word. And then for spiritual renewal and restoration. The thank offering is an offering as an expression of gratitude. 
It is the recognition that we have been blessed. You are blessed this morning than untold millions of people who could not get out of bed, who could not dress themselves, who could not drive to church. You don't know how blessed you are this morning, but I want to go on the record by saying, he blessed me today. He woke me up this morning. I don't take it for granted. I have life. I'm alive. I'm here in the house of the Lord. I dressed myself. I had breakfast this morning. I came to God's house, and I didn't come for any other reason than to look up and say, you are good and your mercy endures forever. You see, if you keep thinking there's got to be one more thing to really unlock my happiness, you have missed what God says is the most important thing. When's the last time you just said thanks for your family, for all the material blessings, your house, your car, maybe your houses, your condos, your clothes, your life. In Psalm 50, there are two verses of scripture we're going to focus on as we exegete the entire psalm. But out of 23 verses, there are two verses that are the conclusion of the sovereign judge of the universe. And he says, this is my order for you. This is what the court is ordering for you. Verse 14, this is the NIV translation. It says, sacrifice to Elohim, a thank offering, and pay to Elion your vows. We're going to look at what Elohim means. Elion means the most high God. When you call on me in time of trouble, I will deliver you. Then you can honor me. I don't know about you, but when I'm in trouble, I call on the name of the Lord. And God says, bring me a thank offering, and we'll keep that relationship. But then verse 23, the one who sacrifices a thank offering honors me, and the one who gives heed to my way or honors me to him, I will let him see the salvation of Elohim. How many want to see the salvation of God in your life? How many want to see your family saved? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word that it is living, it is active, it is quick, and it is very powerful. I pray, Lord, that we would encounter you in the midst of your living word this morning. I pray, Father God, that you would make your word come alive in the hearts of your people. I pray, Lord, that your anointing that rests on your word would break yokes and freedom, newfound freedom, would be released upon your people. I thank you for it all. In the wonderful name of Jesus, everybody said. Psalm 50, look at verse 1. I mean, it is amazing. It says, the mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken. I mean, it's like the psalmist By the way, whose name is Asaph, he was a part of David's choir. It's like he is stacking the names of God. He uses three names here right in the first verse. He said, listen, El, Elohim, and Jehovah, or the I Am, is speaking. Wow. Let me know that's pretty powerful stuff. Three titles that he gives here. You say, Pastor, why are there so many titles for God and titles for the Lord Jesus? Because how can you express the magnificence, the magnitude, and the power, and the grandeur of an all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present God by one name? No, there's many names because no matter what you call him, he's greater than that name. Come on, somebody, give him praise. The first name El simply means God. It's a Semitic term for God. But the second name is Elohim. It is in the plural form, and it's used 2,600 times in the Bible. It is the first name given for God in the Bible, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. That is the word or the name Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the revealed name Elohim occurs only in Hebrew. It means the one and the only God of Israel. Though Elohim and the Im is plural in Hebrew, it is singular in its sense. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Elohim is monotheistic in its connotation, though grammatically it's structured to seem to be polytheistic or many God natured. Elohim expresses, however, the plurality of God's majesty, his might, and his power. The radical meaning in the singular is mighty one. And so the psalmist simply says mighty one. And all English translations call him the mighty one. I mean, the message translation, Dr. Eugene Peterson says, God, the God of all gods, God now is speaking. Wow. Elohim suggests the fullness of divine personality and the foreshadowing of the doctrine of the Trinity. Let us make man after our own image. It is the name Elohim. Elohim is plural, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are a trichotomy creation by God. You have an eternal spirit. You will never ever cease to not exist. You will either exist in heaven and then live on a new earth in Christ, or you will forever exist and live in a hell of torment that was never created for you to live in. You have an eternal spirit. In that way, you're like God. But secondly, you have a soul. Your soul is your intellect, it is your will, it is your moral conscience. And when the Bible says whatever you gotta do not to lose your soul, do it. If it's your eye, pluck it out. If it's your hand, cut it off. Don't ever lose your soul. What does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and loses his soul? What is a soul? I mean, the soul is your power to choose. It's your sovereign will. And when you lose your soul and go to hell, you have no other choice. The time is finished. Your power and ability to choose, you have lost your soul. But then thirdly, we live in a body. We're an eternal spirit. We have a soul and we live in this physical body. Redemption includes our spirit, our soul, and our body. I know we had the funeral for our loved ones, our dear saints. I know we prayed and we sang and when we gave each other comfort, we laid them in the casket and they were lowered in the ground. I know their body's there, but they're more alive than they've ever been. They've ascended into heaven, but they wait, there's more. He's coming again and those graves are going to open up and their bodies are going to be raised and changed in a moment. He's going to redeem our bodies. Why? Because we're like him, spirit, soul, and body. Now the third name here in verse one is the I am name. It's never repeated in the Bible because we don't know how it was to be said. It is simply four letters with no valve pointing. And so whenever you come to this name in the Hebrew Bible, it is simply translated Adonai, which means master or Lord. This name was considered to be too holy to try to write. We don't know if it was Yahweh or Jehovah. We simply know it's the one who is. It's the existent one. It is the being one from which all else has come to be. It is the personal name of God that was revealed to Moses. Elohim is the creator God. Jehovah or Yahweh, Adonai, is the personal name. It is in a causative stem in the Hebrew grammar, which means whatever your circumstance would cause me to be, to come to your aid, that's what I'll be. If you're sick, I am your healer. If you're broke, I am your provider. If you're in darkness, I will be your light. I, whatever you have need of in battle, I am your victory. I'm the God who is real and who is there, and I'll be everything you ever have need of me to be. Would you give him some praise this morning? Hallelujah. But what does Elohim mean? The Hebrew language flows up and is established by the root letters of the name. Agrarian language, if you would, Elohim is the root word composed of two letters. Aleph is the first one. And then the original Hebrew is the symbol of an ox head. It represents strength and force and power. 
I'm telling you, as we were just in Africa, the, the uh, ox over in Africa, the Cape Buffalo, are so powerful. They are so persistent that even lions won't even back them down. I want to look up something interesting. Look at YouTube and how a Cape Buffalo can stomp an adult lion into the ground. And so God is powerful. The second letter is Lamed. The original letter looks like the letter J and is a symbol of a shepherd's staff. And so you have the strength of the ox and then you have the care of the shepherd. He has authority. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Who, the one who has all authority, is my shepherd. So when you put the elf and the lamed together, you have the idea of strong authority or a strong one who has authority to care for his own. Can somebody say amen? You see, Elohim is God, the one who is the strongest, the one who has the most authority. In Christ, he becomes our shepherd. God is more powerful than any other being that has power, ultimate authority. All will give an account to him, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, El Elohim, Jehovah God. Wow. Elohim, the one who is the strongest. Now, the psalm begins, and El Elohim, Jehovah God, summons the earth to court. It's a powerful thing. There are two different courtrooms in this psalm. It's 116, that's verses 1 through 16, and it's 1723. The first ones that he calls to court are his own people. And isn't it interesting that he calls his own first? And isn't it interesting that we live in a day when we are enamored with the courtroom scene? I mean, we have moral court, people's court, animal court. We've had Judge Wapner, Judge Judy, Judge Mathis, Judge Joe Brown, Judge Alex. For the old timers, we had Perry Mason, Murder One, Matlock, L.A. Law, The Practice, Boston Legal, Law and Order. It seems like we as human beings just can't get enough of the courtroom scene. And so God, El Elohim, Jehovah, breaks in through Psalm 50 and says, I summon the earth to the courtroom. Heaven is the ceiling and the earth is the floor. As we look at this text, we begin to see that he calls the defendants to the bench. Verse 5 says, gather to me my faithful ones. Verse 7 says, God is the chief witness. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. Who's God speaking to in the first court scene? He's speaking to his own people. O oh Israel, I would testify against you. The defendants in this trial are God's own people. 1 Peter 4.17 says, Judgment begins at the household of God, and it begins with us first. If it does, what will become of those who disobey the gospel of God? The indictment is this. You are insulting God. A wrong view of God was leading to a wrong way of sacrificing or giving to him. The psalm is a word from God regarding how and more so why we give to him. Look at verse 8. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. So the indictment is not that they are giving sacrifices, but they were giving it with the wrong mindset. The wrong mindset is that somehow God needs another bull or somehow God needs the blood of a goat. Think about it. The whole cosmos attests to the fairness of this court. You see, there are two things that are essential to be a just judge. Number one, you have to have competent knowledge of the case to be tried. God, he is fully acquainted with every person. He knows our rising up, our lying down. He knows us from the inside out. All spoken words and overt actions, all unuttered thoughts and motives. Proverbs 16, 2 says, all the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. In this courtroom setting, God doesn't need any outside witnesses. 
because he knows each and every one of us through and through. A judge to be just has to know all that needs to be known. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, verse four of Psalm 50, even the wicked for the day of evil. Secondly, for a just judgment, there must be a righteous judge. Judicating the case. Years ago, we lived in an area where there was a very well-known judge, and he wasn't known for ruling well on the bench, but he was known for his party lifestyle and his dabbling into things that he shouldn't have been in. Everybody knew it in the city, and yet he would continue to get reelected and reelected. He was a judge, but he was not a just judge. Our God sits on the throne, and he is truthful and just. His judgment throne is called great white. It's white because it's characterized by purity and righteousness. The charges he brings against his people, he doesn't just conjure them up. He looks into your heart. He looks into your soul and said, I know you better than you know yourself. And this is what I bring you to court for. You're insulting me by your giving. That's the indictment. Their sacrifices insulted God because in their hearts, they thought he needed these sacrifices. They thought he was dependent upon these sacrifices. Verse 9 reads, the sentence for the insult is given in verse 9. I will accept no more bulls from you, from your house, nor male goats from your fold. Verse 10 through 13 explains the rationale or the explanation of the indictment. This is the heart of the text. This is most important because it reveals what God really wants from us, his people. The explanation has two parts. One part is in verse 12. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the whole world and everything in it is mine. Verse 13, as a matter of fact, I do not get hungry, God says. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? The people had a view that God was somehow dependent on them, that somehow they had the religious notion that their gifts were somehow meeting God's needs and that he would be at a loss without them. Paul said in Acts 17, 25, God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, for he himself gives to all men life, breath, and everything. I want you to take a deep breath with me right now, would you? You ought to, with the next breath, say, thank you, Lord. Because your next breath is a gift from Almighty God. What is God's right to lead my life, Pastor? Well, he fashioned you. He shaped you. You live on his earth. You drink his water. You breathe his air. Sometimes I wonder why any of us are still alive. Come on. Think about it. God is never hungry. He never lacks nothing. God owns everything, the world, and all that is in it is mine, he said. The point of the psalm is that there are no exceptions. God owns everything. Strictly speaking, human beings own nothing. What we call ownership is really stewardship. And from the birds of the air to the bugs of the field, from the beast of the forest to the cattle of the hills, God says, everything on earth is mine. And the only way you can approach me that please pleases me is simply come and to say, I thank you for my life and I thank you for all you've given to me. This is precisely what Israel had forgotten and we forget it as well. They were insulting God with a mindset that they would now give to God some of their possessions when everything belongs to God. If I have something to give, it's because it belongs to God and he put it in my hands. If I have a will to give, it's because God put that in my heart. All our giving must be a sacrifice of gratitude. If we don't see this, how can we but not insult him? 
You see, the correction is this. God is never poor or deficient without us. God owns the world and all that is in it, all that I have, my next breath and my next heartbeat. So it is like God is saying, the correct mindset toward me is one of gratitude. Don't forget, I see all these sacrifices of bulls and goats and birds and what have you, but what you can only give to me is something I offer, I receive from you, and that's thanksgiving. Verse 14, pay your vows to the Most High. A vow is not paying a a salary or paying a bribe. It's simply keeping your word. You make a vow to God, you're saying, I'll be honest to my word. It's a matter of faith. Be thankful. Pay your vows. Call for help in the day of trouble, and I shall rescue you, and you will honor me. You see, a thank offering is a recognition that God owns it all everything. He doesn't need, nor is he dependent on anything I could give him. And so on this regard, I bring him the offering of thanks. A thank offering is that recognition that he is above everything and everyone else and that he owns it all. His ownership is universal. All living creatures belong to God. All what the world's wealth belongs to God. All the heaven's host belongs to him. All the souls of men belong to God. All mankind are stewards of what belongs to God. And all things belong to him is the revelation of this psalm. I'm going to ask our musicians if they would come. God's ownership is universal. And if you miss this, you miss the very foundation of what pleases God in our giving. First Chronicles 29, 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Think about it. All living creatures belong to God. Every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains. All the world's wealth belongs to God. Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Deuteronomy 9.18, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish the covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. All of heaven's host belongs to God. Deuteronomy 10.14, indeed heaven and the highest heaven belongs to the Lord your God and also the earth with all that is in it. Did you know nations belong to God? Proverbs 21 and verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Can I say to you this morning, one day every Chinese knee is going to bow. One day every Russian knee is going to bow. One day every atheist knee will bow. Every agnostic knee will bow. Every Buddhist knee will bow. Every Islamic knee will bow. One day all white people will bow their knee. All black people will bow their knee. All Indian people, all Hispanic people. There's not a group of people on planet Earth that will not bow their knee and confess with their mouth, Jesus, you are Lord. You are Lord. Receive this into your spirit. All the souls of men belong to God. Isn't it interesting that even in the 21st century when there's an aviation disaster, the evening news reports how many souls were on board. An appropriate nomenclature. Ezekiel 18.4, Behold, all souls are mine the soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, it's mine. Not only is God's ownership universal, it's absolute. Psalm 24 reads, the Lord owns the earth and all it contains, the world and all who live in it. For he set his foundation upon the seas and established it upon the ocean currents. His ownership is absolute, universal. And we are simply stewards. 
John Wesley put it this way, when the possessor of heaven and earth brought you into being and placed you in this world, he placed you here not as a proprietor or an owner, but a steward. Because God owns everything, we need to relinquish our claims to everything to him and realize that we are his stewards. 1 Corinthians 4, 2, moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. His judicial ruling is sovereign and just. Deuteronomy 4, the Lord, he is God, and there is none besides him. Know therefore this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon earth beneath. There is no one else. In 1715, Louis XIV of France died after a 72 year of reigning. King Louis XIV called himself, quote, the great. He was the monarch that was made famous the statement, quote, I am the state. His court was the most magnificent in all of Europe, and his funeral was equally spectacular. As his body laid in a state in a golden coffin, orders were given that the cathedral should be dimly lit with only a special candle set above his coffin to dramatize his greatness. At the memorial, thousands and thousands waited in hushed silence. Then the bishop, Maslion, began to speak. Slowly reaching down, he snuffed out the candle and he said to the crowd, only God is great. Amen. You and I, we've been bought with a price. And the only thing I can ever give God that he really wants. Thank you. Thank you. I don't take my life for granted. I thank you. It's a thank offering. Don't think for a moment you're here today because you've been so wise, so disciplined. You've ate right, you've exercised. You were smarter than others. No, you're only here and alive today because of the grace of Almighty God. What you thought you got out of, God's hand was behind it all and said, oh, I'm gonna make a way for you right here. He sustains, the Bible says. Colossians 1. 16, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, biologists tell us that there is a protein molecule in our, our bodies called laminin. Laminin is one of the multiplied thousands of protein molecules found in the body, but it is a unique molecule called a cell adhesion molecule. It has the assignment of holding everything together in the body so it doesn't fall apart. It seems that cells organize in the body into specific structures and the organization determines what protein they are and what they do. There are upwards of 60,000 of these in the body and the structure of the cells tell the cell what its job is in the body. A cell adhesion molecule, it holds everything together. And you know what's most amazing about this molecule? is when scientists look at it under a microscope, it is shaped like a cross. Now I say it's the cross that's holding all of earth together. Planet earth has been paid for with a price. You could go to any country and say, God, Elohim, Jehovah, 
the I am has redeemed you. Have you received his redemption? Have you thanked him for it? The cross, it's what holds marriages together. It's what holds families together. It's what holds churches together. The cross will hold your world together. It's been said there's two kinds of people in the world. There are sinners who have not yet received mercy and sinners who have knelt at the cross and received mercy. The first court session is not with the lost, it's with God's people. It's like God is saying, Israel, I call you into the courtroom and I want you to get this straight. You're not giving me anything that I need when you offer these sacrifices. Only what I would receive from you is an offering of thanks, a thank offering. On November the 5th, as we prepare our hearts, I'm going to ask every single one of you to begin to seek the Lord. And on that Sunday, we will present a corporate thank offering to our God. But I'm reminded of the words of Martin Luther. I have held many things in my hand and I've lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. It was Alexander the Great who conquered lands unknown. The map didn't even go that far. He ordered that when he died, out of the crash would be his arms. They wouldn't be wrapped. And they asked him, why, sir? Because I want everyone to know, you may have a lot in this world, but you're not taking anything with you outside of this world. If we don't get the foundation of our giving right in the eyes of the judge of all men, we miss it. We think we're giving God something that we worked hard for, we own. No, God owns it all. We simply give him thanks and worship him. Let's all stand together this morning. I don't know who this word is for today, but I, during praise and worship, I, I saw a, a mourning dove that had an injured wing. And as I saw the hand of the Lord reach down to pick the dove up that was just hopping on the ground, he took the dove and he began to heal that wing. And it was like the Lord said, I will heal the wounds of my people. And today, if you're here and you've been wounded, if you're here and you've been injured, if you're here and you're going through a situation in your life and you don't know why you're going through it, listen, there's healing for you today. If your life seems to be falling apart and you've not realized it is the power of the cross that holds you together. If you've drifted and your heart's just grown cold, I invite you to come. But I wanna pray for you this morning that El Elohim, Jehovah God, would be pleased when you give him an offering of thanks.